Barry Tramela for the presentation today. Well, thanks. Um, I'm a little deflated this year. I understand your last two uh, speakers have been Hunziker and Weiberg. So I rank number three on that list, I promise you. So I don't know what I can tell you. It's a good thing there's nothing going on that we'd want to talk about. So uh, it's crazy, I can tell you. I was driving up here, and I uh, anytime I get uh, like north of Guthrie, I flip over and listen to Robert on the radio because I can't get him down, you know, about south of Edmond. So I always like to listen to what he has to say. And he threw out a couple of theories, which I hadn't heard. And my first reaction was, well, that's not going to happen. My second reaction was, that's not going to happen. And my third reaction was, I didn't think any of this was going to happen. So I'm not dismissing anything. Um, I have no idea what's going to happen. It's nuts. Uh, somebody asked me, you know, when the, when the news about the conference realignment broke, I, I wrote for two weeks just all kinds of stuff. And I still got a long list of things to still write. And somebody emailed me and said, you've been telling me a whole lot of stuff, and I've appreciated it, but one thing you haven't told me is what you think about all this. So last week, I told people what I think. I think it sucks. I hate it. Um, I like things sort of normal, you know? I, told some, I don't know if I've used this line. Some of you know me fairly well. Some of you don't. But I'm about the most consistent guy you'll ever meet. I'm 60 years old. Since 1981, I've had two jobs. I've lived in two houses. I've driven four trucks. I've been to three churches, and I've had one wife. So I'm a pretty consistent guy. I sort of like being in a conference with Iowa State. I like Ames, Iowa. I like Lubbock, Texas. I'm not crazy about Waco, but I can go if I have to. So I don't know what's going to happen. I'm reasonably confident about OSU going to land on its feet and somewhere viable. I just don't know where. It's a little bit like, you know, when you, when you get bought out by a new company and the bosses keep saying, everything's going to be fine, everything's going to be fine, everything's going to be fine. Well, that means everything's probably going to be fine, but I still want to see it happen. And that's where I think OSU is, just the uncertainty of it all sort of unsettling because we're talking about a lot of money. Um, my estimations are that if, uh, if, if the big 12 or whatever we want to call it stays together and moves ahead without anything major happening, the annual hit is going to be about $15 million to the OSU athletic department. What's nuts is in this day and age, you can even rationalize and say that's not that much money because the goofy budgets have gone so high. But the truth is, that's a lot of money. They're going to have to find ways to supplement that $15 million. So that's why it's unsettling. There's, there's things about it that are a little bit exciting, I think. Um, potentially new opponents to play. You know, I don't know how you guys feel, but whenever I see that Kansas Jayhawk, if it's the winter, I get excited. If it's the autumn... I'm really not paying much attention. You know, playing Kansas in football, lost its allure. Full confession. You know, I go to an OU or OSU game every week. And the last time I went to a football game at Lawrence was 1998. I hadn't been in 23 years to Lawrence. They tell me they fixed up the football stadium a little bit. I literally don't have any idea if they have or not. I just, I don't go. So, um, you know, there's going to be whatever happens, some of it's going to be good, but we're going to lose a lot. We're going to lose a lot because of uh, just tradition and connections. And um, while I think OSU is going to be fine, I don't know about Kansas State. You know, and I like Kansas State. 
I like Manhattan. I like the people. I like, I like the fans. I like everything about Kansas State. And I worry about Kansas State. And I worry about Iowa State. I don't really worry about Baylor. I think they're in trouble, but I don't worry about them. But um, so I don't know where we're going. You know, I don't, don't have any idea where, where we're going. But um, it's going to be unsettling until it happens. So that's, uh, that's all the light I can shed on that for now. Um, the good news is we get to forget about some of that coming up quick because they're going to start playing football. And that's always fun. To me, it looks like a very exciting year for OSU. Uh, the, the roles have been reversed. You know, if, if uh, Gundy can just produce uh, uh, an offense that his defense would be proud of, they'll have a pretty good season. You know, used to, you think, uh, can they stop anybody? But I think old Jim Knowles has had a good defense last year. It's going to be even better this year. So get that offense going. I think OSU is going to be uh, a Big 12 contender. But I don't know if they will get it going. Spencer Sanders has been the quarterback for two years, and he's just played so-so. And so-so doesn't get you very far in Big 12 quarterback. And so that, to me, is the key to the season. You don't want to put it all on one guy, but that's just the truth. So uh, we'll see how it goes, but it should be a good year uh, for, for the Cowboys. Um, quick hitting stuff. Basketball's going great. You know, does anybody participate or read Dave Hudson's fan survey? You guys know what I'm talking about? Old Dave is a guy named, o he, his internet name is OSU Dave. Sounds like a goofball, but he's actually an investment banker. So he's a really sharp guy. He's a friend of mine, lives in downtown, or works in downtown Oklahoma City, lives in Edmond. He does this, this uh, survey of OSU fans and ends up, you know, hundreds and hundreds of fans participate every year. And he sends me the results and Got the results just the other day, and he asked dozens and dozens of questions. But one of them is the popularity of the leadership, the coaches, administrators, all that. And um, the main, one of the main themes in popularity has been the popularity of Mike Boynton. And this year, Mike Boynton ranks number one. He's more popular than John Smith on camp among fans, which is just crazy because everybody. <laughs> Everybody loves John Smith. You know, even Sooners love John Smith. So uh, Boynton's just doing a great job. And we had a lot of fun uh, in basketball season with Cade Cunningham and getting back to the NCAA tournament and all that. So basketball's going great. It's going to be fine. Uh, basketball's one of those sports that's going to be, doesn't matter what the, you know, the conference ends up being, basketball is going to be great. In fact, I'm going to, my idea for Kansas uh, on this conference realignment, just drop football and join the Big East. That's what I'd do if I was Kansas. So, uh, you know, OSU doesn't want to do that. You don't want to drop football, but Kansas could do that. So uh, basketball in Stillwater is going to go great. Uh, it's back on the rebound, and that's, and that's fantastic. So um, last thing I'll say before we get to questions is, uh, man, what a baseball stadium. I got to come up to the uh, official – uh, dedication of Obrate Stadium when uh, when uh, W was here. That's right. So um, just a phenomenal place, just unbelievable. In fact, we were talking after that Field of Dreams game last week. Somebody had a discussion about cool places to go, and somebody said, you know, places like uh, um, I don't know they, uh, where they filmed. Uh, what was the, the uh, Women's Professional League? League of Their Own. League of Their Own, the movie League of Their Own. Play in uh, Evansville, Indiana, where those guys played and where they filmed part of it. And then play in, uh, uh, somebody said suggested an aircraft carrier, which uh, might be a short home run porch for some of those hitters. But uh, I said, hey, go to O'Brate Stadium and play a major league game. That'd be a lot of fun. So... Uh, I think uh, the future is pretty bright for Josh and that baseball program. But where he's going to be playing, I don't know. So uh, I am open to all ideas. Like I said, I refuse to believe any of it. I was sitting. I actually had an afternoon off on July, whatever that day was, 21st maybe. 
my granddaughters were over at my house and they brought their friends from the neighborhood and they were all swimming, about eight kids in the pool. And I was just sitting there by the pool watching them swim and I got a call from my sports editor and said, you know anything about this new report? I said, what report is that? Oh, you're in Texas going to the SEC. And let me tell you what, it ruined my day. I got to be honest, because uh, I wanted to sit by the pool and uh, watch the granddaughters. And uh, I've been sort of uh, head on a swivel ever since. So uh, I don't know what's going on. I said, I don't believe that. Well, by sundown, I believed it. So I don't know what's going to happen, but I'm open to any ideas and I'm open to any questions anybody has and wants to, uh, wants to throw at me. Um, the question is, what's going to happen with the NCAA? The NCAA has basically abdicated the throne, is the best way to put it. Um, if any of you are familiar with uh, high school athletics and how things operate on the high school level, the OSSAA, the Oklahoma Secondary School Activities Association, really isn't much of a governing body. They just sort of organize things and count the money at the basketball tournaments. That's exactly what the NCAA is going to do. They're going to organize things, and they're going to count the money from the basketball tournament. They're not going to enforce. They're getting out of the enforcement business. They're getting out of the legislative business. They're basically have thrown up their hands. The Supreme Court has whacked them across the head about 15 times in a row when they finally surrendered. So. The NCAA's power is virtually gone. And that's one of the reasons, one of the things that's fueling conference realignment a little bit is the power has gone to the conferences and the schools, but the schools through the conferences. So a school like S the SEC, uh, conference like the SEC and the Big Ten sort of see the vacuum and realize, hey, we can sort of run things. Um, a, a, a conference like the Big 12, could have, but it's really not in position of power or prestige to do as much. So that's one of the things that's, that's fueling the realignment. But the NCAA, as we know them and have thought of them for 60, 70 years, is gone. That's, that's going away and not coming back. The NIL, the name image likeness. Um, Here's what I imagine the NIL to be like. I imagine like it's Oklahoma territory about 1894 is what I think it's like, which just sort of do whatever you want to. Who's going to stop you? Um, I actually think it's great for the players. I really do. I got no problem with the financial way it's going. Uh, if you don't know what we're talking about, name, image, likeness, athletes are now free to make as much money as they want to off their name, their image, and their likeness. Sign with anybody, do anything. And a lot of them have. You know, Nick Saban the other day said his quarterback was approaching a million dollars in uh, endorsement deals already. That quarterback is uh, Brian, what's his name? He's a freshman. Anybody remember his name? He hadn't even, the problem is, He's never played. He has yet to play. You know, if you want to pay Tua Tagovailoa a million dollars, that's one thing. He's pretty good. Brian Young, or is it Bryce Young? Bryce Young, am I right about that? I think it's Bryce Young. Bryce Young has never played, and he's approaching a million dollars. Spencer Rattler from OU, he went to the National Collect uh, – uh, the National Collectors Convention in Chicago last month. That's where you go and uh, all the big collectors of sports memorabilia convene, and they buy autographs and footballs and all that stuff. And Spencer Rattler was invited to go. He sat next to Barry Sanders and Michael Irvin signing autographs. I don't know how much he made, but the estimation is in the $100,000 range. Spencer Rattler's pretty good. 
He's really good. And this year, he might even beat Kansas State. He lost to K-State last year. I mean, he may win the Heisman, but I don't – it's not for sure that he's a superstar quarterback. So it's crazy, but it's good. I'm glad the athletes are making the money. Uh, no coach can gripe about it. If you see a coach griping about NIL, slap him down. Because the coaches paved the way for this, making the crazy money and the, the, uh, somebody like that. But, uh, but, you know, it's time the athletes, you know, got some of that too. To me, the university should be thrilled with NIL because of this reason. The athletes are getting paid, and they're not the ones doing the paying. Somebody else is. So what's not to like about that? The only thing you really have to do is sort of monitor it and administer it. Administer it. And like we just said, the NCAA is not lording over you saying, you got to do this, you got to do that. So I think, it's a, I think it's a good thing. You mean the lack of administration? Well, I mean, it. some people fear it that, you know, that, let me give an example. You know, the state of Alabama is fairly serious about football. You might be able to find some businesses in the state of Alabama that are interested in paying uh, Alabama football players more than market value for whatever they're doing. My response to that is, so what? So what? It's not like Alabama isn't getting football players. They're signing any football player they want already. So um, I don't see uh, people who say it could upset competitive balance. The same teams are in the playoff every year. What kind of competitive balance is it going to upset? So to me, Gary Patterson down at TCU said, this is actually a good thing for the little guy. He, th he said he thinks it'll, it'll help us. And so I'm reasonably optimistic that it's really not going to affect things. I think the best players are still going to go to Alabama. They're still going to go to Ohio State. They're still going to go to Clemson. And people like uh, North Carolina State and OSU and Ole Miss are just going to have to work hard and try to beat them. That's really the way it is, whether we have NIL or not. I have a question here from Zoom. President Shrum and A.D. Weiberg seem to have handled everything really well. Do you agree? Um, yeah, I don't know how, I don't know what else they could have done. You know, um, Chad's been really quiet. Uh, Chris told me he didn't really say much in terms of news breaking while he was here on the conference realignment. So he's been that way with us. He really hadn't said anything. Casey, you know, she was sort of, uh, a boisterous that first Friday and then the next Monday, critical of OU and the big and uh, ESPN and whoever else. But my point was, I mean, what? I didn't mind that. She's taken up for her school and she's trying to rally the, trying to rally the troops. You guys keep you guys fired up and engaged and and not not down. So, yeah, I don't have a problem with how they've handled it. Um, I assume they're working around the clock. You know, working on. The future and where that's going to be, whether it's another conference or, or fortifying the Big 12, whatever it becomes, I don't know. But um, she's very impressive, and everybody seems to like her. And I think, you know, I think the future is pretty bright in terms of OSU leadership. Is a little bit of a bad draw for her, you know. Her and Chad go on the job on July 1st, and on July 21, their world gets turned upside down. I mean, think about that. You know, if it's Burns and Holder, you could say, well, you guys have been a couple of old war horses, you know, just tough it out. But, you know, bad luck for Chad and, and Casey, but, but I'm reasonably confident they'll be fine. And, um, and like I said, they're, they're very, very popular. And everybody, we sort of know Chad. People like me don't know much about Casey, but everything I've ever heard has been good. And everything I've seen since then has been good. Well, he asked how active Bob Bowlesby, the Big 12 commissioner, is in holding the conference together, and is it going to work? The answer is he's 
he's pretty active in trying to hold it together. Um, when it comes to Bowlesby, I love Bowlesby. I think he's a very good at his job. If you want to say he should have known something was up with OU in Texas, I can't argue with you. That's his job to know stuff like that and be on top of things. But nobody knew it was up. Literally, one of the best kept secrets, they've been working on it a year, and all of a sudden, nobody knows about it. And then one day, everybody knows about it. Um, here's, how I, here's how I sort of picture this OSU's, and everybody, all eight schools, their mission. It's like if I told one of you, I need you to be in Seattle. What's today? Thursday. I need you to be in Seattle Saturday night. And I also need you to be in Los Angeles Saturday night. And you can't fly. You just got to drive. Well, you say, well, how do I do that? Well, there's one way. You start driving west. And at some point, you're going to have to turn. You're going to have to go northwest, or you're going to have to go down to Southern California. But the key thing is just get going in the right direction. And that's what OSU spot is. They're going somewhere. They're going to a new conference. I think probably the Pac-12 is most likely, but you never know. Or they're going to have to fortify the Big 12. We don't know which one of those places they're going to land at, but they got to be moving towards that. And that's it's sort of like having your foot, you know, one foot in two rivers is what it is. And you're going to have to pick at some point, but you can't pick now. So you just got to work. And, you know, they've done all the heavy lifting. Thanks to all the facilities that the, you know, the OSU facilities are as good as anybody's. So they're in good position. They've been successful across the board. If this was 1996 and all this had happened, things were not be so rosy in Stillwater, I promise you. But today, things are reason for optimism. You just don't know what's going to happen. So there's things they need to still do, but like I said, the, the heavy stuff has already been done, and that's, that's good. That's good. I feel good. He asked, how long would OU, uh, over under number on how long OU in Texas will stay in the Big 12? I was, when this first started, I thought, if counting this season as one, one and a half would have been the number I would have set. Now, I'm going to set it higher. I'll set it at, I might set it at three for this reason. There is no incentive, literally no incentive for West Virginia, Kansas, Kansas State, Iowa State, OSU, TCU Tech, or Baylor. Zero incentive to negotiate them out early. There's zero incentive. Whatever the whatever the near the near term financial television package is going to be is not going to be as much as what it's going to be this season or any subsequent season still with the Sooners and Longhorns. No reason to let them out. Just say you want to leave in 24, 25 in the summer of 25. Okay, we wish you well. We'll just carry on until then and no you know, the the television package is going to take a hit that's that's the problem fox does not want them out early the biggest loser in all this is fox television network they've lost two of the prime brands in college football they're going to the uh, sec which means now which means totally espn so fox doesn't have them anymore Fox is going to hold on to them, want to, as long as they can. So unless they want to write a really big check, and I don't know that even writing a big check would do it um, because the the financial ramifications. So I tend to think they're going to be here a while. So that means I don't have to go to Starkville, Mississippi for quite some time. I don't have a problem with that. Yes. Yeah, he asked, what's going to happen to the Longhorn Network, which, by the way, is the genesis of most of these problems. Um, I, think, 
I think uh, ESPN and Texas are likely to negotiate a settlement. You know, that's been the biggest, uh, the biggest uh, mess for Texas. It's not just, let's see, it's 20 years, 300 million. Yeah. And we've had about 11 years of it. So nine or 10 years left. So they owe Texas $15 million a year. Plus, it's not like they just set up and Texas has to run it. ESPN's running it for Texas. So all the expenses are, tex are ESPN's. I mean, it's just one of the worst business decisions of, of recent media history. So ESPN would love to get out from under it. Texas realizes that it's not been what they hoped it would be. They're ready, I think, to just get rid of it. The coaches hate it because they got – Longhorn Network cameras on the inside all the time, and you know how coaches are. They, they're paranoid. So I think that's a negotiating thing they're going to get rid of. Um, but it's not going to be a small price tag because, you know, I don't know if you guys knew this, but they like their money in Austin. So they're going to they're gonna try to get it. Well, uh, he asked about – with the NCAA's loss of power, how, how does that relate to the OSU uh, sanctions on the, on the uh, probation? Basically, I mean, NCAA tournament. Um, they're still sort of going along those lines. They're just phasing all that out. I have always thought that OSU was going to win their appeal. But in typical NCAA fashion, it's just taken forever to get anything done. And I think just, I think the NCAA has lost its stomach for enforcement, even if it thought it was right, which I don't know if they think that or not. But even if they thought they were in the right, I don't think they want to fight it. And, you know, when somebody like Alabama has the same, has basically the same, uh, the same infraction, and did not get a, a postseason ban, it's hard for anybody to stand up and say, well, we're going to stand by what we did to OSU. And OSU can always bring out the smoking gun, which is, you guys know, don't you, talking to the NCAA, that Will Wade, the LSU basketball coach, still has a job, even though the FBI has him on tape admitting to buying a player. So please explain yourself. That's something that you can always trot out there, and they don't want to listen to that. So I think it's all going to go away. I just don't know when because, you know, the NCAA is just such a sluggish organization. It just takes forever and forever and forever. He asked if I ever want to pull my hair out when I work with Trey Berneshbeck every day. The answer is no, for this reason. Um, at the age of 60, I have realized that my hair is about all I got left going for me. As you can see, my wife has been on my back for literally four months to get a haircut. And I finally told her the other day, I said, listen, I get compliments on nothing except a bunch of guys my age still say, I wish I had your hair. So... I don't really want to get it cut. I'm sure not going to pull it out over those two guys. But, um, but I, uh, I tell people about Ash Beck and Traber, I tell them several things. One is I cash my checks. So that's what they pay me for is to, uh, to do that stuff. The other thing is uh, they're interesting guys. People like to listen to them. You don't necessarily like them, particularly Traber, but you like listening to him. You can't, you can't turn, away, turn him off. Um, here's what I'll tell you about Eshbeck and Traber. Um, Eshbeck is not as, you, as he seems on the radio. He's not. A, he actually acts halfway normal when I'm on with him. I realize that, and I appreciate it. I also know that later in the evening, and sometimes with Jim alone, he gets goofy. And he says stuff you shouldn't say on public radio or in polite society. He's not that way in real life. He's sort of a normal person, as normal as you can be from New Jersey. But 
Traber, he's exactly in real life as he is on the radio. He literally has no on and off switch. He literally has, it doesn't matter to him if we're on the air or not. Says the same thing, acts the same way, everything's the same. And I sort of appreciate that. I mean, in some ways you can respect that because you know exactly what you're dealing with, with Traber. Anything else? Chris asked how how ESPN and the how the SEC and OU in Texas pulled this off without A and M or anybody else having a clue. And I have no idea because I didn't know anybody could keep a secret like this. I literally didn't. Um, you know, the, the thing I think about is this: we had another great secret in the last year, and that was those four or three conference commissioners and Notre Dame's athletic director formed a committee or were appointed to a committee and worked on a playoff proposal to change the college football playoff. And nobody knew they were serious. Nobody knew what they were talking about. Nobody knew they were doing much of anything. And then just out of the blue, here it came. They're going to propose a 12-team playoff, go from four to 12. That stayed a secret for a year. And then the same calendar year, or the same 12 months, this secret was held. And here's what's fascinating about it. Two of the commissioners on that four-man committee, Bob Bowlesby of the Big 12, Greg Sankey of the SEC. So while they're keeping this massive secret from the world, Sankey is keeping this equally big or even bigger secret from Bowlesby. That's the stuff of like a, uh, you know, a, a major motion picture. I mean, that's, in, that's international intrigue. I don't have any idea how people, I know some people that can keep a secret. I'm actually one of them. I can keep a secret. If somebody tells me something, I won't tell them. You know, people say, you got to tell your wife everything. If it's, a, if it's a secret, I'm not supposed to tell anybody. I won't, I won't even tell my wife. But it sure looks like there's not very many people like that. Most people like to talk. I don't know how they did it. The reason, now it was easy for the SEC to keep it from A&M because they knew if it ever got to A&M, they would start a forest fire and away we go. You know, the Aggies are not happy. They're not happy at all because think about it. They thought they had landed in paradise. They were in the best conference. They were getting all this money. They were doing pretty well. Not as well as they think they are, but pretty well. Texas sucked. They weren't doing anything. And they were getting all the recruits. They thought life was great. And then all of a sudden, somewhere around July 20th, somebody said, you know Texas is about to join the conference. You're talking about an anvil dropping on your head. So... Um, I don't, I don't know, I don't know how they kept it from A and M, but um, they sort of just told A and M to go sit in the corner is what they've done. So it was a little bit of a come up for for A and M. Uh, I don't really feel sorry for them. I don't know how you guys did you when you were in the conference with A and M. Did you OSU people? Did you feel a kinship with A and M? I'm, I'm, just, I'm, I didn't know. I mean, I sort of I understand there's a kinship between. OSU and K-State, no OU and Kansas, and that kind of thing. I never felt any kinship with A&M. I thought they were largely kooks, is what I thought. So I can see not telling them anything, just staying away from them and not talking to them. But, um, so I don't know. But it's, it's a monument to secret keeping. I'll say that. It's, I, I certainly didn't see it coming. Is that it? Thank you. Thank you.